Hi everyone. Um, sorry about that. My Dell thing decided to conk out at just the right time, so that's brilliant. Uh, so my name's Peter Horn. Um, I've been working at NI in November. It'll actually be 20 years um, in quite a variety of roles. Um, but I wanted to rename this presentation slightly from building a standardised development process to trying to. So I don't want to anyone to be any any kind of illusion that I think this is finished because it's not. In fact, we're just kind of in the the early stages of trying to get it working and building it out. Um, I wanted to start off though, as I was first on the agenda, just to say it's great to be back. It's been a few years since I've been able to make it to one of these events. I want to thank everyone who's been involved in organizing for it. I'm trying to remain calm or at least appear calm. Inside I feel like this though, so uh, we'll, we'll see how this goes, hopefully good. Um, quick story about the Our Giants of Female. Um, my son, Alfie, over at the left there, I was talking to him about this the other night at, over dinner, and he basically said, can I choose who you talk about? Like, yeah, sure, go for it. And Alfie loves space. Um, he, and he chose this lady, Vera Rubin, who was one of the sort of pioneering astronomers. She Apparently, when she was a five-year-old child, she would look out of a window and start, um, a bit older than five, I think, but started measuring kind of uh, the tracking the stars across and measuring their their sort of their movements in kind of no making loads of notes about that and eventually discovered the fact that there must be something in between all those stars and that was dark matter that none of the other astronomers kind of wanted to admit was there and they all basically said no you're a woman you can't be right um, but she proved the fact that there was dark matter there and that kind of upset the astronomy community because um, that meant they'd only been investigating about sort of a tiny fraction of the uh, the universe that was out there. Um, so she got told when she was at school to basically ignore science, become an artist. And apparently when she was the first female astronomer at this observatory, um, there was no female toilet. So she stuck a skirt on one of the male toilets and said, now that's the female toilet. So um, yeah, definitely fought a bit of kind of uh, adversity and uh, difficulty in her early career, but she's... Uh, Certainly Alfie thought she was pretty great and I think pretty awesome too. Um, so in terms of what I wanted to actually talk about, I thought I'd start off with kind of what my the problem statement is within the group I work in at NI. Um, and some of the tools that, and techniques that we're using, um, that's what the automated acceptance testing section is about. I wanted to also just quickly mention why I avoid YAML in pipelines it's kind of a, a bit of a snippet. Um, I was going to call it why I hate YAML, but that's kind of possibly a bit unfair to YAML because it's not really YAML's fault, but I'll talk about that in a minute. So the problem statement, basically everything is changing. So I work in the transportation business unit and I in our um, CCS group or complex customer solutions. And primarily I focus on our ADAS replay platform. So if you go on ni.com, you can see this picture which shows we've got an environmental server, which is basically a host PC, a PXI chassis, and then bus interfaces over to the ECU. If you want to know more about the ADAS repair, I can talk about it, but that's not the focus of this presentation. But what I wanted to show here, though, is basically over on the right is the ECU. This is the DUT that the customer is supplying to us and asking us to build a test system to replay data into. Generally speaking, we're getting these projects, and they're kind of time critical projects. The customer is trying to get ahead in the market, and the ECU is kind of new to our new technology for them. So that is generally speaking under development, and there'll be things like the outputs, maybe the the um, by the the debug signals coming out from it aren't implemented at the project start, or maybe they, it doesn't accept the camera feed in some way at the project start. So generally speaking, that thing on the right, pretty much always under development. Um, probably partly led by the fact that the DUT is under development, and this is a new technology or a new area for most of these customers. The customer requirements, they don't quite often, I find, know exactly what they want, or they, those requirements are definitely not finalized or well-defined. And so there's a lot of change there as well. The bit in the middle is the NI part. That is, quite honestly, we there is a release now. We're no longer working on pre-release builds, but it is still being developed 
rapidly and where there's new features being updated or added regularly. It's, um, so there's a lot of moving parts is what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to build a standardized process on top of that where we can get reuse from code modules or plugins into this um, application and try and gain some kind of efficiency. That's been pretty hard. So I'm trying to find ways of doing that, which is what I wanted to talk about today. Um, so the site slide line into why I avoid YAMLs, YAML and pipelines. So we use Azure DevOps. They, use, uh, they have this technology called pipelines, which is where it's similar to, I think, GitHub Actions. And most of the CI tools have a similar capability where you can trigger a pipeline to run based on something like a, either a schedule or a pull request being merged into a branch or pushed to a branch. There's lots of different ways that you can trigger it and then run some number of actions such as run all my unit tests, run VI Analyzer, um, run build specifications, whatever you want to do. If you can write a piece of code to do it, you can probably run it through a, a pipeline. The problem we've got though is that there's no Azure DevOps plugin for LabVIEW. So I can't just say to, in my pipeline, call this bit of LabVIEW code and run it. I can do it via some other technology. So the first technology that uh, we tried working with was basically PowerShell scripts. So this is an example of a PowerShell script from one of our pipelines. Does anyone want to have sort of guess at what it does? No? Probably not. It's, um, so essentially, this is based up the sort of most of the way down the, the brackets in the middle, it says LabVIEW CLI, and then it basically running VI um, a Karaya unit tests, which are in this run tests in folder VI, and running, uh, running that on a set of projects in, the, uh, in, a, in a set of folders. So that, and that's, that's fine, it works. The problem that I had with this was, first of all, that's difficult to debug in the you can't run that YAML pipeline other than by just running the YAML pipeline. I can't just click on it and say, run this test within the, or run this stage or job within the YAML pipeline. Um, I have to run the pipeline, which probably comes with a whole heap of other things that it's trying to run. The other problem is that it's just technology or tools that most people, or certainly the team with, that I've been working in and I don't really know that well. So it kind of works. The step that we took to try and make it a bit easier was just above where we're actually running the command. We put the same command with a right host in front of it, which means that it prints it out to the console so that if there's a problem, that, gets, that line gets printed out to the console. I can copy and paste it into a command prompt and try running it there, see what the issue is, which works, but it wasn't ideal. So as I say, this uh, running PowerShell scripts directly in the YAML is not ideal. There are ways around it. I could have saved the PowerShell scripts as PS files and then called those PS files in the, in the pipeline, which would have been one way. Um, another approach that I tried out was essentially to wrap my LabVIEW code into a Python node, uh, or a set of Python code. And the Python code would call LabVIEW either via LabVIEW CLI or GCLI and then run that section of LabVIEW code. And that worked, adds a bit of complexity and adds, lay adds layers of different tools. But the advantage there was I could just get that Python file, open up a command prompt or, or just um, Visual Studio code and run that Python file. And it would run my LabVIEW code and effectively I could run the step and debug whatever was going on in the step separately. Um, so that's definitely good, but adds a bit of kind of, in my view, kind of needless complexity, or not needless, but um, extra complexity that I don't necessarily want. The, the, the alternative, or the approach that I'm trying to use at the moment is kind of a dual approach. So I'm sure many of you in the room will have heard of Hample Software Engineering, and they, they've got a set of tools called Release Automation Tools, or RAT. Um, Jörg's here. And I'm sure if you want to know more details about RAT, then he will happily talk to you. Um, I think it's pretty great, and I've been evaluating it for the last uh, couple of months. 
Rat has the advantage that it takes a lot of the complexity of that needs to go into those PowerShell scripts and the, all the intelligence, and all that intelligence is in Rat. And therefore, the PowerShell scripts to call it can be much, much simpler. Um, and effectively, it's just a copy and paste of a PowerShell script stage um, in, my, in, the, in the YAML file. Um, I didn't actually put a screenshot of one of those sections of YAML in the code. I, if anyone wants to see it, I can, I can show it later on. Um, so I'm trying to go for a, a kind of a dual approach now um, with the latest pipelines where if the, oh, sorry, RAT has a lot of capabilities. It doesn't cover every single thing that we need currently. I'm obviously talking to Jorgen, the, the HC team, about th what we're doing and trying to add new, help them see where what tools would be useful for us to add into it and in discussion about whether they should be part of the product or something custom that we would build. But where I can, I'm trying to use RAT and just sort of have simple uh, RAT calls via PowerShell scripts in my YAML pipelines. There are definitely places currently, and I imagine there will continue to be places where RAT doesn't cover every single need that we have. And for that, those places, I'm going with that approach of build a, a piece of LabVIEW code that does what I need, and then build a very simple Python script around it that I can very easily call from my, uh, my YAML file. And that kind of, I don't, know, don't necessarily know if it's the best of both worlds, but it's definitely a, uh, a good compromise of approaches, I think. Um, so, a very quick summary. My, if you're using YAML, or the, the other thing, problem with YAML I have is that YAML is used in GitHub Actions, I think. Uh, I think most of the CI tools use YAML to define their pipelines, but they all use it in different ways. So if you Google how to do something in GitHub, um, either GitHub Action, it probably won't apply to how you're doing in an Azure DevOps pipeline, um, which is frustrating. So my advice, if you're doing pipelines with YAML, find a way that works for you to avoid putting the intelligence in the pipeline. If you have the intelligence in the pipeline, then I just find it becomes, those pipeline files become very difficult to understand, very unmanageable. Um, YAML's white space delimited, which means that it's horrible to debug. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, that's my recommendation there. Uh, we've, or I've certainly been working on trying to move that intelligence out and putting it either in LabVIEW or Python. Uh, maybe there's a different way, there's tons of different plugins for DevOps for, to make integration with external tools easier. Maybe within your team you have knowledge of one of those other tools and you would find it easier to go via one of those other tools. But definitely my recommendation is to avoid YAML. Um, so, on to the actual thing that I wanted to talk about, which is this automated acceptance test architecture and how we're trying to use it to, um, well, how I'm trying to push NI to use it to increase our quality, hopefully increase the reliability of things like our estimates that we're giving to customers and to our leadership about how long a project's going to take and how much effort it's going to be. Um, so I read this book by Dave Farley. Um, it's, it's quite a thin book, and I thought it was very, very good. Um, one of the things that it said in it was that if you're building any system and you're delivering that to a customer, you should obviously have acceptance test criteria that you need to meet. So for an ADAS replay of the system, that may be something like you have to, the system must stream eight camera streams at 30 frames per second with a certain resolution and a certain frame rate, um, must log all the CAN data and must not fall over for an hour or something like that. So you, you have some very defined test routines that you can say this either passes or fails. And then you sh if you can get those test criteria set, kind of in concrete at the start of the project, then you can build a set of VIs or career tests in this case to effectively test those. And the idea behind this is that you should be able to say, once all those tests pass, there is no further work on the project. You don't need to then build it and give that delivery to a customer. You should build it and do these tests on the actual build. So once the build, once these tests pass, there is no further work to do, which is a very nice idea. 
and I've been trying to kind of promote that within NI. There's been a lot of thought of that won't really work in our situation and stuff, which I think it's exactly what should work in our situation because if our system's not repeatable, then it's no use to the customer. It turns out, though, I'm not the only person in NI who's thought of it. I spoke to one of our colleagues over in Korea who's been... I had similar ideas, and he had a, a slide that yeah, I think articulates it, so articulates it a lot better than I do, which is where you have a total number of tests in grey that you're building up over the course of the project. At the start of the project, most of those tests are going to fail, and then as you carry on through the project, the number of test passes goes, uh, and goes green, goes higher and higher, and eventually you end up with all passing tests, and you say, OK, Mr. Customer, here's your set of code, it passes all the tests that we agreed on. And if they say, ah, no, but I wanted it to do this and that and that, then you say, okay, great, that's a change request. So it's, hopefully it will take away a lot of that kind of negotiation of, I kind of want it to do this and it kind of doesn't quite do what I want kind of thing. So it's reliant on having good test criteria at the start. So going back to a simplified diagram of our or ADAS replay offering. I mentioned you've got host PC, and then the Linux real time, and then some interfaces over to the ECU. For our pilot, at least, I basically decided that we're going to eliminate the ECU from this because having the ECU in the loop, if that's under test or, or sorry, under development or unstable, then that's going to make integrating it into something that's automated much more difficult. So for the pilot phase, at least, and for uh, some, of the, some of the acceptance testing, the plan is that we will have a separate Windows PXI, which will be effectively a record system, and we'll loop back the data from our Linux PXI into, into that. And that means that we can check that we're replaying the data correctly, and that we're doing what we, our system is doing what we expect, um, and obviously doesn't test the actual integration with the ECU. So in terms of what that would actually look like for our development team, the idea is that we would have all of our developers pushing into a Git repository. Um, then whenever we do a, a push, a merge to the main branch, uh, you, would, you would trigger this pipeline. You could also trigger it on a push to any branch, and maybe have a trigger push to push to every branch and then just do something like a very small set of unit tests to give the developer very quick, rapid feedback on what they're doing and say, actually, it's violated these tests. You need to go away and kind of uh, rethink that before you, you push it to the main branch. But in terms of actually merging to the, the uh, develop branch, I'm thinking it would be something like we initialize the build machine run the Karaya unit tests on any of that code that's changed, run VI Analyzer on any of that code that's changed, and then build the configuration. And the configuration in this case is going to be a set of NI packages for any custom code that we need to build. And then there's a, uh, well, basically push them into a system link server so that they can be replicated over on the, the validation machine. So that would be, that's the bottom step of push to server. Um, in terms of the split between RAT and NI capabilities, RAT covers the first three cases there out of the box at the moment. The build configuration, because we need to build NI packages and push them to a system link server, I'm, I haven't worked out yet if, that's, if I can do that through RAT. I, I probably need to talk to Jorg a bit more about that. But I've got some, uh, some bits of code that can do a lot of it. So I, I will figure out how to make that work over the next few weeks, but it's, that's still in development. And then you need to have some tracking of what builds have been published and what state they're in. So things like uh, if, it, if a build is then given to a customer, you want to make sure that you keep that build and you mark it as tested and part, it's passed all its tested, tests in a database somewhere so that you know what the um, what builds have gone out to the customer and obviously track the version numbers. So that those builds from this pipeline on the left would all be pushed into the up onto the server somewhere. 
and have a and yeah be stored there. Then we've got this set of tools called cats, and it's not except uh, it's not escaped my attention that I'm trying to make cats and rat work nicely together. But <laughs> yeah, so there we are. Some of these things just happen sometimes. Cats is a set of internal tools that we've built recently internally, or my, the NI R and D team have built recently, which is essentially using System Link Server to uh, deploy and configure an ADAS replay system. So we'll talk to the environmental server or the host PC and the Linux PC uh, PXI, sorry, and it will deploy all of the System Link packages, uh, sorry, the NI packages on there. So using Cats to configure the system with whatever the latest build is. Um, one small point here, you don't want to do all of this testing on every build that comes out of that. Um, every time you merge to the main branch, that triggers a, a build of the a new build. If you try and run all of this testing on every time you build, then you're just going to end up with a backlog of those builds. It's far better to schedule this pipeline on the right here to run every day or every other day or something and just grab the latest build. So we grab the latest build, configure the test system, then run our acceptance tests. These are just going to be unit tests written in Karaya. They'll be very big unit tests probably. They'll do things like spin up the ADAS replay application, configure all of the host plugins or host executables via gRPC, configure everything on the Linux via gRPC, run the scenario, maybe it runs for an hour or so, capture all the data and come out with a pass fail result of is all my data synchronized? Um, so they will be big unit tests, but they are just unit tests with a definitive pass fail result at the end. And then DevOps has some quite nice tooling that you can generate an, uh, a JUnit file from Karaya, and then there's a step called publish uh, test results, which means you can just publish or you just get a nice dashboard of the test results. Um, I actually have. I've spoken about most of this already. So what I just said. Um, so this is the dashboard here. Um, so you can see there we've got a test pass rate of 100% in the middle, pipeline pass rate. Apparently, I think that's probably when I was developing that particular pipeline, it failed a few times. And then you get some stats out about sort of the pipeline duration. Essentially though, what I'd be looking for is that the test pass rate gets up to 100%. Once you have all of your tests implemented that for the customer acceptance and they're all passing, then you can say to the customer, here you go, the tests have all passed. Um, now we the, the project's delivered. So just a final point about the kind of the end goal and how I plan to try and scale this up. Um, talking to the NI kind of leadership. Um, I'm unlikely to be able to get sort of budget to have one of these test systems per project. Um, they obviously want to try and have some kind of benefit of scale of the fact that we have lots of different projects and, and that absolutely makes sense. So I'm thinking we'd have something like a number of different projects and they would all have different criteria that they would be using. So maybe project one ha is using 1.2 release and is, has got GMSL2 cameras, maybe other projects, I forgot to change the project numbers in these um, boxes here. I've just noticed that. Um, so project, another project maybe has FPD link. So they would all push to, the, to their um, develop branches. And then in the cloud on a, a VM that would be hosted on our server somewhere, we would do that initial um, unit test, VI analyzer, merge it into the main branch and, and build the uh, build configuration. That build configuration would be put on a, a server somewhere, and then we'd have hopefully some farm of different uh, validation systems with different capabilities. And then within DevOps, you can set up different the capabilities as requirements. So you can say this build, this PXI system, or this this build, it has this version of the software on. Maybe has an FPD link card and a GMSL card. This other one has a GM, just a GMSL card. And then within your pipeline, you define what the requirements of the, um, on the, the, for the validation system, you define what requirements are needed. 
and then effectively we would schedule each project to have a, maybe a four hour slot on each of, on the right build machine. So uh, for this bottom project at two o'clock in the morning every day, it would grab whatever the latest build output is and run the VI, uh, the, the acceptance testing on whatever the right machine is. I put a dotted line in here just because I thought there may be some scenarios where we may want to parallelize it. So if, in this case, if we had GMSL2 and FPD Link 3 on the project, maybe maybe FPD Link was a, a later addition, then you could scale up the testing and instead of just running it on one machine, you could run it on two machines at the same time. So that's uh, pretty much everything I, I wanted to talk about. Um, so just a quick summary. If you build using YAML to build pipelines, find a way that works for you to remove as much of that intelligence from YAML as possible and keep the YAML simple, just because I personally certainly find YAML difficult to debug and uh, there are much easier ways of getting LabVIEW testing to work inside YAML. Um, automated acceptance testing I think is possible for certainly what we're doing in our team. We need to make sure that our acceptance criteria are well defined up front so that we can write VIs that uh, pass or fail against those tests, or those test criteria. Um, again, sharing hardware between projects is possible. Um, that's one area that I think needs quite a lot of thought on this, because if you, if you try and share hardware in the wrong way, then it just makes the whole thing more complex and kind of more brittle and more likely to fail. And if this starts falling over and failing and being unreliable, then we're not going to get the benefit from it and the teams won't want to use it. And then we're absolutely on the first stages of building this out. So uh, we're reusing some existing tools with the NI cats and uh, RAT, and as I say, trying to make them play nicely together in this case. So that's uh, everything I want to talk about. I will open it up for questions then. No. Just. Uh, thank you very much for that talk. It was really uh, useful and quite interesting. Um, I was just wondering, in here you've talked quite a lot about using uh, Azure DevOps. Mm -hmm. and I was wondering why you choose that over another option like Jenkins or I think GitLab's another alternative. Like, What's the yeah. thought process behind that, please? Uh, so honestly, I, I didn't choose DevOps. It's the tool that NI has standardized on for our internal development now. Um, everything that I've talked about here could be done, I'm pretty sure, through GitLab, CI, or Jenkins. Any of those CI platforms could do it. Um, so I don't think anything is DevOps specific. OK, thank you very much. OK. Is there any other? Can't see anyone. Oh, no, Nancy. <laughs> So a key piece of that was the Karaya and the use of Karaya and how you structured it. So do you have another presentation lurking somewhere, past, present, or future, um, on how you guys are using Karaya? I, I don't have one written. I, I can definitely make one. Um, Great. And I connect. You're signed up. <laughs> <laughs> Said the wrong thing there, didn't I? <laughs> any any um, just guidance and and things that you like about Karaya or, or something that uh, we can take away just on, on that piece of it as well? Yeah, I find Karaya just um, is it fits into my workflow very easily, and it's very easy to take a piece of code that I've written for, like if I write a small uh, test that I just kind of see the output like. Put, give some inputs and then maybe have some LEDs or something on the front panel, run it, and I get the, the green LEDs and say, hey, great, that makes my test pass. It's kind of super easy to then just turn that into a pariah test. And it, it's kind of a low barrier to making all these tests. And then uh, I just find it really satisfying when I run, I add some new feature and then run all my tests and see it, all the pariah boxes go uh, blue and everything's passed. So, And then... Likewise, if I uh, if I run everything and it all goes red, I think, oops, what did I do there? <laughs> so, <laughs> so no, it's good. Ah. So, 
the whole system must be built of uh, like all kinds of software and mm -hmm. things you need to install and configure. So how do you ensure that if you need to recreate the system that, that you build it the same or? So that, that's what the CATS is going to do. So CATS is, um, stands for Customer Agnostic Test System, but it's essentially as a system link server and then a set of NI packages. And then you pass it a configuration and it will, in, in, the, in the configuration it's got, these packages need to be installed on the Windows side, these need to be installed on the uh, Linux side, and it will just build up the system for you. Okay, Chris. Firstly, firstly, really nice work. Thanks. So what do the build artifacts look like? The build artifacts? Um, so the, I think, honestly, that's still a work in progress. I haven't actually got that far with it yet. This is, like I say, still under development. The configuration, so all of the packages need to be on the system link server. So if, the, if we're using some of the off-the-shelf plugins that R&D have built, then they will already be on the system link server and I just need to pass the configuration file, which is basically just a JSON configuration. Um, if we're building some like some host executables or custom plugins, then I'll need to build those into packages and put them up on the system link server as well. Okay, um, last question. I just wondered if there were any special um, considerations when it came to the configuration involving multiple packages, potentially of different versions of NIPM underlying that? Versions of NIPM? Or yeah. The yeah, and the packages that you're using within your configuration. So my, I think the, um, like the, the version number of the packages would be part of that configuration. So we would obviously say, we're, we're on ADAS Replay 1.2 and this package version and so on. Um, I've kind of assumed we would just aim, always aim to be on the latest version of NI Package Manager, but haven't 100% tested everything there yet. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, sure. Uh, in terms of uh, the hardware setup, uh, do you have a dedicated setup or how it is? Uh, set up for the unit testing as a whole. So the, yeah, there's a, these, oh, hang on, my, that's gone, never mind. Um, so yeah, the, we, you, I need, we need to have a dedicated hardware test setup. There was some discussion with, oh, there we go, let's come back. Um, so these, these things over on the right, they consist of basically a full, a full test system of, there'll be a host PC for that and the Linux real time and then there'll be a separate, sorry, Linux real-time PXI, and then a separate Windows PXI for the recording part of it. Um, so each of, those, each of these test systems will have that. There was some discussion with leadership of, can I just reuse the test system that we're doing the development on, and basically schedule these builds to happen at a time when the, uh, the developers won't be working on it, which is, Kind of a nice idea, but I just know that we would end up in a situation where this had either left it in some state that meant the developers got annoyed with it in the morning, or the other way around, where the, the developers left it in some state that meant cats couldn't talk to it or something. So we're, we're aiming to have a farm of these that we can ship these builds to and share them between multiple projects and just schedule the time on them accordingly. Does that answer the question? Uh, yeah. Yeah, but basically it's uh, the same setup which is shared between the developers and the test setup as well. Yeah. Oh, well, so these are dedicated setups for the validation test, but it's a replica of the test <laughs> setup okay. that we would have for yeah. the developers. Thanks. Okay. Awesome. Bye. Thanks, Pete. No worries. Thank you. Mm -hmm.